What is up, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Valley coming at you with a second a, emergency podcast. It's an addendum. Um, I was listening back to the one I did, and not only did I include a double intro, um, but it was just too much of a chaotic because I recorded some stuff after other things and moved things around. Um, it was a hectic night, so I was going to fix it and just add, uh, not add anything in and just delete the intro, but we're going to just update the entire audio and do this together. I haven't decided whether I'm going to repost it on YouTube. Most of the stuff still holds up. We're going to get back into everything again. So let's really dive into the New York Knicks trading for Mikael Bridges in what was, was a, they gave up a lot to get Mikael Bridges. And so the final package on those details will start here. Um, the Nets are getting Boyan Bogdanovich um, and they'll his salary will be guaranteed because it's going to be part of the, uh, this has to be done in the new league year. Um, they're getting four unprotected Knicks picks in 2025, 2027, 2029, and 2031. They're also getting the Bucks' 2025 first-round pick from the Knicks. Um, that will convey if it's between selections 5 and 30, so it will most likely convey. They will also get a 2028 first-round swap from the Knicks. That is unprotected as well. And they're getting a 2025 second round pick. The Knicks are getting Mikhail Bridges and a 2026 pick. The Nets, I believe, do have their own second round pick. They also have one. It's the least favorable from Detroit, Milwaukee, or Orlando. So that could be the one that's headed out as well. I think what's most important, I mean, look, Mikhail Bridges, the Knicks decided that this was the move, but I really want to get into what this means about fleshing out the rest of their team and who's coming back because the reporting has been all over the place on that. And what I'd done the first time is I went through this, this trade effectively as it is right now. Um, and that's how I treated it on this first iteration of the podcast. It hard caps the Knicks to beneath the first apron because they aggregated salaries and took back more money than they're sending out. Now, had they sent out more money to where they would have been saving, um, they would have been hard capped to the second apron. And so staying beneath that, which would have been made it easier in theory to keep Isaiah Hartenstein and OG Ananobi. There's still a chance. This is the part that got cut out of the first podcast, which is why I'm here doing this again, that they can still amend this trade, expand this trade to either send more money to Brooklyn. Um, there could be, they could do some sign in trades with their own stuff, precious Chua, Alec Burks, if they really wanted to. Um, or it's a matter of, do you flip a Mitchell Robinson? Do you flip a Julius Randall? Robinson has been in the rumor mill, rope in a third team. Maybe the Nets even want him. And are you getting less pick equity? They would definitely prefer the picks. We will get into the Nets and Rocket stuff uh, and the Sun stuff that's related to that, I promise. So, that's why I think the salary structure is so important. I personally think, and this is why I framed the podcast that way and will continue to do so, that the Knicks are going to be operating underneath um, the first apron. And we'll get into why, I guess, after the fact, but let's go and really dig into the Knicks' finances here, which I'll be the addition. If you're listening to this twice, I'll be even more clear on because I was blowing through the minimum cap hold and stuff. Not everything needs to be an emergency podcast, as it turns out. Okay, so if you're on YouTube, you can see this cap sheet that I had uh, cooked up. Very, it was still the very quick version of it, but I added in the minimum holds. And so what we're going to do is let's just delete. Let's put $0 on the books for uh, OG Ananobi and Isaiah Hartenstein. If you assume that the Knicks were going to pencil in um, at least two minimum holds here, uh, for the, like just to assume that they want to have the 14 players, and they're, they're going to want even more flexibility beyond those actual minimums, but we're going to pencil in as of now, just two minimum holds in addition to if they want to bring OG Ananobi and Isaiah Hartenstein back. I think the player to start with here, well, let's go with this. So without OG Ananobi and Isaiah Hartenstein, and if you're going to plan on the Knicks in this scenario, uh, you are really having, so this would be the 12 roster spots ones. You have $135.8 million. Again, I'm including two just minimum roster charges here as well. That accounts for Julius Randle, Jalen Brunson, Mikael Bridges, Josh Hart, Mitchell Robinson, Dante DiVincenzo, Deuce McBride, picks number 24 and 25, picking up Jericho Sin's option. I'm just, I'm jettisoning Daquan Jeffries, all the non-guarantees and other team options that they have. So you have 135.8 committed to uh, those players, plus the, the chart, like the minimum roster charges I included. Now the cap is at 141. That's where it's projected to come in anyway. Um, again, they, they, that, like that number doesn't matter. They're not beneath the cap of this. So you have to figure out a way if as the trade is now to fit OG Ananobi and Isaiah Hartenstein under the first apron, which is $178.7 million. Or if you wanted to expand the trade, you could in theory try to do it so that you're expanding them beneath the second apron, which comes in at about 189.5 or close to it. The challenge here, I'm going to use 
like if we wanted to use the second apron as an example, I think the number to start with here, whatever apron you're using, actually, I think the number to start with is Isaiah Hartenstein's max that he can get from the Knicks, which is 16.2 million, basically. So let's throw that in there. I would be shocked if he ends up staying and then staying for less. And so if you're, again, we're operating under the assumption they're trying to keep both of them right now. We'll get to the collateral damage of all this in a second. You pencil that in. And so let's use, again, let's use the second apron specifically right here. If you were hard capped at the second apron, um, you would still have about $37.5 million left in theory to fit in OG Ananobi. Um, that I don't, I actually don't think that number is going to end up being enough. I would take the over on it if he signs for, I know a lot of people, I've seen Pencilman for 35 million. If the Knicks, Knicks get him for that, they should be super excited. That would be like, that would be a massive discount, but based off all the reporting, it doesn't seem like he's inclined to go that route. If you would ask me, does he get what's more likely for him to get below 40 million or signing just a five-year deal, maybe like at the $40 million mark, I'm going to take the latter. Like I, I'm sure the Knicks maybe want to try and get it to a four-year deal, but so, but that $37.5 million number, it's at least you look at it and say, okay, this is semi-workable or do we need to change out one of our, you know, let's just change out one of our picks. Like, let's send that out for something else, like a future seconds or, or something, let's just say, and we clear up, um, did you, you trade pick number 24, it's technically worth more and you clear up in that perspective. Okay. Now all of a sudden it's at like 39 for OG. You could go the route of moving Deuce McBride. And then all of a sudden it's okay. Like that's at 41 for OG. Um, and that's so much closer to his match, which is 42.3. The issue here is I don't think the I don't think the Knicks are going to operate that way. Like you, I guess you could expand the trade still, but you would have done this already to me. Like you would have had those terms hashed out and those would be leaking out. And the fact that they haven't, I think is, uh, I think it telegraphs that they want to work beneath the, um, that they want to work beneath that first apron. And I understand why, because you are looking at this as moving forward. Julius Randle's a player option on 25, 26. That's, you could extend him off this number. He's a you know, 28.9 this season, you could extend him off his player option number. He can decline it. You can go that route. Um, Jalen Brunson is also going to be due up. He's a player option for 25, 26. There's been rumors that he'll sign the four year, $156.5 million extension he's eligible for now. He'd be punting on a lot of money because he would be eligible to sign a five year, like $270 million deal next summer. I'm not saying he would get all that, but he would get some version of more than for 156. Now, the thing I'd entertained was. It was part of this trade, you know, it was just kind of understood that, okay, if you go out and get Mikhail Bridges, uh, are you going to, like, will Jalen Brunson then just extend? Because there's something about all these dudes playing together. Josh Hart, um, you know, the, the Villanova Knicks, you know, Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, Mikhail Bridges, they won a national championship together. So you actually can't, I do, sometimes even on this podcast, we probably dismiss sentiment a little bit. I just, you can't rule that out here. But I do think part of the calculation here is we're, this team is going to be a tax team moving forward, like a, a heavy tax team. And so having to stay beneath the first apron to them might not be seen as the worst thing uh, in, in the world. Just like it keeps their finances under a little bit more control. And so, no, you're not going to end up ducking the tax entirely unless, again, you let Isaiah Hartenstein walk. But I think that's the way the Knicks are going to operate here. And so the challenge would be if you wanted to keep both OG Ananobi and Hartenstein while ducking, while being hard capped to the first apron, let's pencil, let's just pencil OG Ananobi in for the max. So with Hartenstein on the books plus Ananobi's max, and then all the salaries that we just outlaid, um, the Knicks would be $15.6 million above the first apron. And so, yes, you could manipulate kind of the roster holds here, but it's just, you know, like you can't getting rid of two first round picks. You could load like both those picks. If you can roll them into future picks, I guess you consider it, but I do think maybe having some cost controlled contributors on the books moving forward will be important. So I don't necessarily think they're going to want to punt on. Yeah. If they're getting more 2025 draft equity, sure. Like maybe they'd be willing to move off of 24 and 25. Um, but you can't just, and the, the difference between this and a minimum roster charge, like if you just replaced both of these with minimum cap holds, uh, not maximum cap holds like I'm doing, Right now, I mean, you're going from 15.6 over the first apron to 12.4 about like, that's not really the opportunity cost. The name I'm looking at here, and he doesn't necessarily get you all the way there would be Mitchell Robinson is could you trade him into a team's cap space that 14.3 million dollar number and then all of a sudden it's okay, we're kind of within 
three million of ducking the first apron here again the way that i've laid out their cap sheet um that's not you could get there by exchanging those first round picks you could get there by dealing deuce mcbride uh i don't like you can't just i will say this you can't just get rid of first round picks one again if you're folding it into future draft equity fine i'm you could be open to it um but like to give up Mitchell Robinson and then trade off of two first round picks or to give up Mitchell Robinson and then trade off of Deuce McBride, like Mikael Bridges gives you secondary creation. We'll get to his fit in a second, but like you could probably talk yourself into okay between Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo and Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle and Mikael Bridges. We really need Deuce McBride. Like right now he's super important to this team. Uh, Jake Fisher did mention that maybe Kyle Lowry is interested in coming and join the villain, the Villanova Knicks. Now that would be, I guess if you think you're getting him, does that make you more comfortable moving off of Deuce? The way to actually do this, and then while kind of staying beneath the first apron, would have to be: Can we trade Julius Randle? I don't. The way that I, I don't know if the Knicks are going there, and also I really would be curious to see. Julius Randle is a two-time All NBA player. He is important to the Knicks. I think that after this deal, because you went all in on a star, that's not uh, not that he's not. You went in on a star who I don't think is, if you had to pick who's the better scoring generator of just their own offense, the answer is still going to be Julius Randle for me than Mikael Bridges. That's not a shot at Mikael Bridges. He's the better, more versatile defender. He's the better better off-ball mover and shaker. And there are just going to be nights where, I mean, like, who are you going to trust off the catch right now? I'm going to trust Mikael Bridges. Let's spot up threes from over Julius Randle there. So, like... Mikael Bridges, to me, is the more valuable player. I mean, you're not getting this for Julius Randle. That's just kind of self-explanatory here. But I think because this is the star or fringe star you went all in on, Julius Randle is still ultra important to your team unless you're somehow getting another kind of shot creator. And I don't think, you know, even in the event they sign Kyle Lowry, that's like, I'm not talking that level. I'm talking and I'm talking above Alec Burks. Does not need to be another star? I'm, I think I'm okay, especially on this team, if you look at this and say, well, Mikael Bridges is your second most important offensive player creator or score i could you could talk me to that being okay i still don't love kind of the macro of the offense just what the spacing could look like um i can't remember who phrased it this way but it's it feels like the knicks could be less than the sum of their parts when you look at this functionally that's really not a bad way to phrase this when you're talking specifically about offense but if you're looking to duck the first apron like the move here i think would be you get you just jettison mitchell robinson so let's do that on the cap sheet like you're taking no money back um, and then you could get rid of Deuce. And that's, again, that's someone that teams would take. Okay. Now all of a sudden you, with OG and Obi's max, you're at a like a million bucks 1.1 million under the, the first apron. I just, that's a lot to give up in addition to what you already gave up. And now what could happen is let's just use the Mitchell Robinson element. So you keep Deuce, um, is OG and willing to sign for, what you're like two and a half million over the apron. Like, could you actually get him? Like if we penciled him in for a 30, let's say an even $38 million salary here. Um, so that's like four and change below his max. Maybe not ideal. Maybe again, ambitious here. I'm not advocating for OG Ananobi to take less, but that would kind of get you there. You could even, it looks like give him a little bit more. Um, so you can get closer to 40 there. Is that something like is that amenable? And the Knicks as a team, you have to ask, yeah, I think there'd be a team that take Mitchell Robinson. I actually think that if I'm OKC, I would throw one of my first, not like a super good first, at least one of my first and say, okay, like we want to run five out majority of the time, but Chet's not going to be on the floor all the time. We could use someone to really fuck up shit on the offensive glass. Um, Mitchell Robinson's going to do that. And you kind of cap his playing time. That's not someone who should be, we've seen him play more minutes in recent years. There's the injury concerns, especially after last season, but like you're not going to rely on him as much. And even if you want, you can try him and Chet out together. Like maybe that's five to eight minutes of their, their like joint, like their playing time together. And so if that's five to eight minutes, then, you know, you look at finding, is it another 12 to 17 more for just Mitchell Robinson as the lone big? I mean, that's something you could absolutely explore from OKC. And I, I've looked, I think there are other teams that'd be interested in him in him too, for that matter. Among the cap space teams, you know, Philly's not going to want that with Joel Embiid there. Maybe Detroit just as like sort of a change up from Jalen Duran and I, Isaiah Stewart. Um, and maybe the Knicks look, there are permutations though, or maybe you're trying to take back a player and you're still looking to cut salary elsewhere. Um, but the moral of the story there kind of is like, if you're doing Mitchell Robinson and not trying to dump Deuce McBride, OG's getting less than his max. If you need to max out OG Ananobi, max out Isaiah Hartenstein, it's Mitchell Robinson and Deuce, I would say. And 
or it's Julius Randle. And I actually like Julius Randle's fit in OKC now. Like as a theory, uh, I don't know. He's so heavy minutes. So even if you think he could play off of J Dub and Shea Gilgis Alexander, and you'd like to see him in a five out environment, we know that Oklahoma City wants to increase Chet Holmgren's ball handling, and they just got rid of one ball dominant player in Josh Giddy. Um, are they going to want to bring in another? Um, would they just say, well, we're going to bring Julius Randle off the bench? Is that something he'd be open to? Then you have to look at paying him long term. If it was just a strict salary dump where they don't have to give the Knicks anything, but if you're the Knicks and you're doing that, that's really tough. And then you go through the list of teams and it's kind of like around the league. I don't know where Julius Randle actually fits a team in, which is so weird to say about a two time All NBA player. I don't mean shade at him. I think he's made strides over the last two years of, oh, I can be part of a larger ecosystem. Um, and specifically last season before he got injured, I, th I thought that we saw that. I just don't think teams are going to come in and value him at even close to the level of importance he still has to the Knicks, even after the Mikhail Bridges trade. This would be my roundabout way of saying my prediction here is that if you, between OG and Anobi, Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson, at least one of those guys is going to be off the Knicks next season. I don't know. I mean, if, if I'm the Knicks and doing this from a cold callous business perspective, I think Isaiah Hartenstein is more valuable. So you're trying to figure out how to make it work beneath the first apron. Now, just for anyone who cares about kind of the, we already went through the second apron stuff. They could still expand this to where that they're not taking, they're either taking back the same amount of money or they're, they're actually taking back less money. And then you can work with that second apron number. I just don't think that they want to right now. I think that because they know how much this team is going to cost moving forward, that maybe this is something that in their minds, it's another year of semi cost control to where, okay, you know, we're still kind of like, we're in the tax here, obviously. Um, but we're not so far deep into the tax. And so I like the bands right now, they're less punitive when you're like slightly entering the tax versus kind of crossing into these apron territories. And those are, I think some of those penalties are like really not even going to be fully realized until after uh, next season. So this would be like, that's my, my way of thinking of why they would do this because I, otherwise I don't know why you would just not have made this so that you could be hard cap beneath this, the second apron. I just don't understand that. Um, and there would have given you way more flexibility and sort of other trades now where you kind of looking to maintain, I, like, I don't, I don't really know what ability you're looking to maintain here like to give you maybe more a little bit more flexibility on the, the buyout market i just are you like so i the fact that it was reported this way and again it could still be expanded it leads me to believe that the knicks are going to try and work beneath the um the, that first apron now what would actually not shock me so if you ask me what i think is more likely do the knicks expand this deal to make it so that they're operating with that second apron i guess if you were getting like a nice player back or like a wild pick or something by moving Mitchell Robinson, you should start, or Julius Randle for that matter. Okay, consider it. But I would honestly argue that it's more likely the Knicks wind up losing Isaiah Hartenstein. So that number is just, we'll replace him with a, a minimum hold here. And so you're going to max out OG at that point. And like, you're so close to actually, I think are you under the, you're so close to like, I frame it this way. You're kind of a salary dump of where you could still move Mitchell Robinson for a cheaper player. And then you're just not paying the tax. That's not something I'm advocating for. I would almost argue that I think it might be more likely that the Knicks end up ducking the tax entirely than that. They're working within the, the second apron cap. So that it's still an option is at their disposal. Um, I know this stuff is all just convoluted. We're all, and like even the stuff with the CBA, like it takes me longer to figure it out, which is why I recorded the first podcast in like this weird uh, reverse that like reverse order. Uh, but I do think that the trade is going to end up being the trade. Uh, it'll happen after the draft. Like it needs to go through that year. And I, I do think that's sort of where we're at is you should view the Knicks as they're not going to go over that first apron. And as a result, you're going to lose either OG Ananobi or Isaiah Hartenstein or my prediction would be Mitchell Robinson. Um, and again, a lot the further collateral damage would be okay. How much does it cost to maintain OG? But I think the Hartenstein number is the Hartenstein number. If he's coming back, um, it would floor me. But it would honestly floor me if he's coming back and he's not getting his $16.2 million max that the Knicks cut off. Now, with regards to just the overall trade itself, this is fascinating to me from the Knicks' perspective because they've decided that they are... It's not just that they're, they're the second best team in the East after this trade, which I think you make the case that at full strength, given the current roster construction, even if they lose Hartenstein, as long as you're getting OG back, um, that you probably are. The Bucks could be in that mix. The Sixers could be in that mix. The Cavs could be in that mix. Maybe Magic gets super spicy. There are teams that could be in that mix, but the Knicks feel like they have a level of 
certain depth and talent like through spots what at this point i mean if you're gonna keep like let's just so we'll get i heart out of here because i don't like if you're keeping randall and mitchell robinson i mean you're looking at I don't, I mean, like throwing deuce mcbride and like you have eight really reliable guys out frame it as if you're losing hartenstein you still have og deuce dante mitchell robinson josh hart mikhail bridges dalen brunson and julius randall that's like a really good meat and potatoes of your rotation and i will say quickly not a manual quickly, but actual quickly that I think this trade, you don't make it unless you know that you're going to get OG and Anobi back. Quite frankly, I know the Knicks were linked to Alex Caruso and they thought their offer was better than what the bulls ended up accepting and getting back Josh Giddy. And that's like, okay, well then if they were giving up certain picks, how would this trade have, have worked? They clearly weren't trying to make it independent. I don't know how far down the road they got on Alex Caruso, but you don't make this trade as a, okay, well we have Mikhail Bridges instead of OG and Anobi, because even if you want to argue that, Let's just say you have last year's Knicks with Mikael Bridges instead of OG Ananobi. So you're keeping Hartenstein, which you could do if OG Ananobi left. You might be better just because I think Mikael Bridges, OG Ananobi is better defensively. Mikael Bridges is more available. He's the more dynamic offensive player. So you could make the case that the Knicks are better off in that vein, but you don't give up five first round picks and an unprotected swap as the central focus of your deal. If you're losing OG Ananobi after giving up Emmanuel quickly, RJ Barrett and that second round pick to get OG Ananobi in the first place. So to me, this actually implies that the OG Ananobi, maybe they're still trying to haggle out the number or the years, the exact number, but OG Ananobi will be back. That would be another shock on my end is if you see that OG Ananobi has left because, um, just because you're looking at this and you're saying, why, why would you give up this many first round picks unless you think you're going to be a top tier championship contender? I think you make the case that the Knicks are still not a top tier championship contender. I think Mikael Bridges is a fantastic fit. He's a fantastic fit anywhere, but like they have that, even if you believe, and it's fair to believe that Jalen Brunson is that a level star, you can question whether they have enough. I would still say specifically on offense around him to compete with the Boston's, the Denver's. Um, and then just overall, when it comes to net talent, top end talent, like even Minnesota, um, Dallas just having two like sort of alphas where it's two top 25 guys. You don't have that right now. Like that, that's just not what Mikael Bridges was last year. Maybe in any given season. Sure. But you don't have that at the moment. So I still think you're probably a tier below Boston, even with Denver's depth issues. And are they going to lose KCP? Like I probably still have Denver over there, but like the Knicks, do I think that they're one of the five most likely champions next year? Prisoner of the moment stuff. Maybe they were definitely to me, the second best team in the East. And that's almost inarguable becomes more arguable if you're losing og Ananobi. so that would be my stance there but you have decided that this is also the move like i believe the knicks i'm trying to think they're the only team right now i believe so far that's traded a 2031 first round pick um it's like you went that far out on your draft you cash this in you decided that we are going to be a championship level team after this there are still things you can do because like you'll have some first you can move after the fact in between there and like you don't have depending on Look, I mean, if Jalen Brunson signs the four-year $156.5 million extension, and if Mikael Bridges in six months, he's not going to sign the two-year extension he can sign now. Uh, he can get like a three-year, a little bit less than a $113 million extension in six months. If he signs that, now you're looking at this team and it's, okay, Pending depending on what Julius Randle gets, even if we've paid OG, even if we've paid Hartenstein, there's no bad deals on the books. And honestly, what becomes the most toxic deal for the Knicks if Jalen Brunson and Bridges sign the extensions that they can, that I just laid out is, I think you're more worried about the OG and an OB. Did you max him out? Did you go five years or what is Julius Randall's next deal? Like that's a pretty good position to be in. So there's still stuff you can do, but you've like, this is the move and I don't criticize them for making it. It does. I think going all in a Mikhail Bridges to this extent, if that was the cost of doing business, their internal view is of themselves is higher than my external view of them. But I don't think that they're, this was an unjustifiable move to where I'm still, this is now 12, whatever hours later, I'm still trying to like my initial reaction is the same where I don't know where I land on this. I think the Knicks are a better team. I don't know if this is going to wind up being worth the opportunity cost here. And I'm very interested still to see how they juggle the finances of it all. So I just, I think most people would probably land on the fact that they overpaid for Mikael Bridges. You were going to have to overpay for Mikael Bridges to get him out of Brooklyn. And maybe there was some of the Knicks Nets rivalry, whatever. They haven't done business together in this way since 1983. I don't really buy into that element of it. Uh, but it's like the fact that they're the Nets, like this was the cost of getting Bridges now 
while the Nets also were getting back some of their own picks from Houston, which we'll get into in a second, um, that's like, what would it have been to get Bridges if the Nets didn't know they were getting their own first round picks back? Honestly, I guess you just assume that they wouldn't have traded him in that scenario. Maybe, but uh, like, this is a, it's a massive cost to pay. And I don't think you can be excited about this Knicks team next year. And again, you still got to flesh this out, but you also have to recognize that this is a big time risk and there's a chance it, it doesn't pan out. And even already you look at it and they've done, it's not on the same level because none of these players are like super old, but none of them are super young either. Like you're looking at Jalen Brunson right now. Uh, he's 27. He's going to turn 28 in August. So 2031 like okay that dude's in his mid 30s is he still on this team um there's a chance i mean the 2029 and 2031 picks we know how windows work in the nba too which is why this is so dangerous even when you think a team is going to be around for a while something always comes there's always a pivot point something an injury a contract situation a tax bill nothing's going to last forever and i think windows are getting shorter and shorter maybe they'll get a little longer because it seems like under the new cba that extensions are even more it doesn't seem extensions are more incentivized and it feels like teams are keeping their own players on longer term deals more but the knicks are kind of in this weird spot where it's like all right no one's on the back end really of their prime i mean look at this roster who's on the back end of their prime but who's really at the beginning of it i guess if you consider prime years age 27 to 33 um how do you feel about that with jalen brunson being a, a small guard uh with mikhail bridges this again is not someone who's just super young he's not super old either but he's 27 years old as well so there's a risk here is what I'm saying. I honestly don't know if this was the deal that was presented to me right now, I probably wouldn't have done it. I like, this is just a lot, but you also have to ask yourself, well, who are the Knicks waiting on at that point? It doesn't make sense to be in the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes, which feels like it ended um, like even before this off season began, since it's likely he signs an extension. That's why I keep checking my phone when I'm recording this is I'm just like waiting for more news that um, like is, is going to break. So I'm just, I, like if you weren't like, were you waiting on Devin Booker, which Houston might be doing? Were you the Paul George situation? You know, you get into that. Yeah. I think the opportunity cost in terms of assets would have been lower if he opts in and then the Clippers trade him to New York, but that number 48 plus million dollars. And unless you're saving money in that deal, you're still going to be in the same situation to work beneath the first apron. Um, and spoiler alert, the Clippers couldn't have facilitated taking on more money unless they were shedding a bunch of salary elsewhere themselves. So fitting in like that was a like a way more massive number so there's also a convenience in this being the player because it allows you to work beneath the first apron if that's what the knicks choose and it's just a little like we just laid out a scenario where in theory at least you could get rid of even if it's julius randall like you're a salary a serious salary dump away or a realistic salary dump away from being able to keep both hartenstein and og ananobi it's a lot harder if you're talking about paul george's 48 million dollar number now if it's dollar for dollar when it's going back, okay, fine. This year, maybe you're able to work it. But like now, what does that make for the implication of, well, we're going to be paying him if he wants the max moving forward. Um, Mikael Bridges, two more years of cost control. We know Julius Randle is a guy that's probably not going to get his max extension. Um, I, I'm, at least I would be a little bit surprised if he did. Uh, so I think he's in like the, what is it? The four year, like one, 180 realm. I can double check that in my, my extension calculator if that's what he's going to end up getting. So like that's going to be even cheaper than Paul George. And look, he's younger. There are Knicks fans that don't want him over, didn't want Paul George over him. So I'm kind of sympathetic to that. He's at four years, 185, 1.5 million would be his extension number. My guess would be he gets less than that if he signs an extension or even in his next deal. I don't think he would get four and 181.5. So I can sit here and, and criticize, or it's not even a criticism. It's second guess the Knicks, but who do I expect them to wait for? Did you really think Devin Booker was going to shake loose? And in that case, do you believe that you would have had the best offer um that's looking like houston might have the best offer if that happens now because of these other chain of events with uh between brooklyn if you know about that too so think about it in those terms if you kind of know that okay well if anything happens in phoenix and i don't really know why they'd be interested in kevin Durant, but if they wanted to be in the booker sweepstakes houston has positioned itself to just outbid anything that we can do and they clearly know that something's going on um, who are you waiting for like who like what was the alternative here so i'm criticizing myself here is what i'm doing this is a lot to give up for the caliber of player that Mikael Bridges is. You need to believe that he's a finishing piece. The fact that I don't think that we can sit here and say, um, 
you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is, that makes this trade a huge risk. But we also can't sit here and say that, well, the Knicks should continue to wait for their alternatives. They were going to get harder and more expensive to kind of fit in anyway because you would have kept OG, because you probably would have, let's say you keep Hartenstein, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle going on their next deals. And so I understand their logic here. It would have been nice if we're sitting here and be like, all right, well, they didn't need to give up the 2031 first or maybe not just swap in 2028. Um, they still do have the Detroit and Washington first round picks. One of those sh I think should convey when you look at how they're protected at the moment, but like there's a chance they're both conditional first round picks. So, but you couldn't in theory attach those to something. Um, Detroit's is protected top 13 in 25, top 11 in 26 and top nine in 2027. That's, you know, I mean, there's probably iffy there. And then you look at Washington's is top 10 in, this year, well, 2025, and then top eight in 2026. I don't know which one I would think is more likely to convey. Probably just Detroit's. I think like it's protected for further out, so that's just the way to go with that one. So you still do have some stuff, but you really you're gonna have to. You're looking at some of the minimums that they're gonna need to hit on. I mean, but they have like depth right now. It's just this is the move, and I think that's that's uncomfortable, just given where given where the Knicks are. Let's talk about the net side of this, and we should also though do that in conjunction. As a recap with the Knicks, they get Bojan Bogdanovich, five first-round picks. Four of them are unprotected Knicks picks in 25, 27, 29, and 31. They get the Bucks pick in 2025, an unprotected first-round swap in 2028, and then a 2025 second-round pick. So you, if you look at the Kevin Durant trade tree, I think Shrieker like, tweeted this out. It's like nine first-round picks in Cam Johnson or whatever it, it amounts to. That's fucking nuts, especially when you consider that with Kevin Durant specifically, not only his age, but you were given, excuse me, um, you were given one team to negotiate with. And so like, that's what you end up at at the end of everything for Kevin Durant. I mean, good, good on you. Now they did this other trade with Houston, um, what they're getting back, their 2025 first round swaps. Now they control their 2025 first round pick and they're getting their 2026 first round pick back. And what they're sending out is a 2025 first round pick. Um, it's the lesser of the Rockets um, or Thunder one. Uh, the 2027 first round pick of Phoenix's, a 2029 first round pick more favorable of Dallas and Phoenix, and then a 2029 first round swap, the less favorable of Dallas or Phoenix. So when you get into the machinations of Houston, I think what's important is that they now potentially control three of the Suns draft picks down the line. We'll get into Houston. When you're looking at Brooklyn, what they accomplished here is yes, you punted on some of the Suns' longer term um, future, but you're getting back your immediate future and allowing yourself to rebuild. You still owe that 2027 swap to Houston, but you now have two years, two years where you could tank your heart out. And that's two big bites at the draft apple. So that's huge because with Mikhail Bridges, they already proved that they weren't as their best player or like their premier player. This already proved that they were not a play in team, even basically, or that that's where they would settle. This is more palatable than let's go out and trade for a Trey Young or a Darius Garland. I'm assuming Donovan Mitchell is just off the table because those players, let's go out and trade for Jimmy Butler. Let's get in on apology. I'm just throwing names out there that weren't even linked to them. You could have added. I, I don't know, like a top, realistically, you weren't adding a top 15 guy. It doesn't seem like maybe Trey Young would have come close to doing that. But if you would have put Trey Young on this team, could you guarantee that they would have been top five or six in the East? Guaranteed. Probably not. And so like, this is the more palatable route. It was the necessary route. Smart of the Nets to kind of posture and say that, they, well, we're not going to move bridges. We view him as the, the guy that we want to pair with our next co-star and go from there. Now, if you don't have your own picks, do you still make this deal? it's enough to where you consider it like just shorting the next future. And it's all right. Like we're going to going to be a rough three years, but some stuff will start to convey. But now that you're getting your own two picks back. And then on top of this, you're getting those five firsts and then plus a swap from the Knicks. You've really put yourself in a great position to start over and aim for higher than the bottom of the middle or the top of the middle. And I don't, I don't think there's anything to hate about this mode of operation Brooklyn, other than the opportunity cost of what they had to give up um to get their picks back which was the 2027 20, suns first and then the 2029 more favorable of dallas or phoenix so if one of those teams bottom out when you just look at that post dating luka Doncic's con current contract in dallas although we would expect him to be there and just kevin Durant going to his age 36 season and you're looking at the 2029 year and then you kind of juxtapose that against the rockets sitting there going like we really want these suns pick for a reason 
And if you're sitting there in your Brooklyn, you have to wonder, all right, like, is there, are we overpaying here? But it gave you the flexibility to rebuild that you didn't have earlier. And could you have gotten out of this with like one less something going to Houston? When, when it was initially reported, it didn't seem like they were conceding as much here. Um, but like the 2027 and 2029 Phoenix picks going out is a big deal, but it shows you the value of having your own pick because you control that. And so Houston fans can't turn around if this ends up being the number one pick and the Nets get Cooper flag in 25, let's say the Nets weren't going to be this bad unless they made this trade, which they probably wouldn't have made unless they were getting their own picks back. So I think that's an important element for the Rockets to consider here. But with the Nets, I love this for the most part because of what it shows about their long-term thinking. But to get to a point where like this is what it costs you to get two of basically your four picks because the number three pick is headed to Houston right now and they saw that 2027 swap to regain control of your of just two of your four picks and just that one number three already technically out the window. But in theory, I get it like I get it. And I think because they also got the stuff from the Knicks that is going to start conveying in those years when they now gave up those Phoenix picks. It makes it more digestible, but they're taking a little bit of a risk there, but it's also, it's just a healthier outlook for the franchise to say, we're going to start over rather than getting caught on this treadmill of, of being in the middle. And so to get this, to get that haul for a player, like you're looking at this package and the Larry marketing emergence breakout in Utah, like changes how much the Cavs end up giving up for Donovan Mitchell. But when you're looking at this initially as a deal, it's on the level of what the jazz got for Rudy Gobert, what the jazz got of Donovan Mitchell. And Mikhail Bridges is not a generational defender the way that Rudy Gobert was. And he's not, I guess he could make an All-NBA team in any given season, but like, is he ever going to be? Don Mitchell's in the conversation for first team All-NBA before he got injured this year. He's in the conversation for second team All-NBA, certainly before he got injured and didn't hit the game's threshold. Will Mikhail Bridges ever be that? And so if you do, you're getting someone who probably will never be I think I might've had him as my defensive player of the year. One of the years he was in Phoenix, not going to lie, but you're getting someone who is not this generational defender, even if he's at that level and he's not an offensive superstar. He's not someone who in any given season is going to make, I'd be, I'd be floored if Mikhail Bridges makes a second team all NBA squad. I'd probably be pretty shocked if he ends up making an all NBA team um, just because of how like the Knicks depth almost works against you there. Unless you're Jalen Brunson. And especially if you're still going to be central to Julius Randall to get that for a player, like that much for a player who's not a consensus caps lock star. He's an excellent player. And this is clearly shows he was desired around the league, but like you have to weigh, I think these two deals together. And so the Nets probably gave up an uncomfortable amount when it comes to getting back their own two first round picks, but it also shows the value of having control of your own just sort of destiny. And now they can, they're not guaranteed to get the number one pick next year, but they're going to be bad. And so now you look at, well, will anything happen with Cam Johnson, who I know a lot of people don't love his deal, don't love him. It'd be nice if he did some more rebounding. He's a little bit underrated defensively. This is someone who will make defenses think on the offensive end, whether he's on or off the ball. You probably could get something for him if you want. And then Dorian Finney-Smith, I think he's like, you know, as an example, I, I think he's worth a late first round pick. Like uh, would Cleveland consider giving up their pick as part of a deal for Dorian Finney-Smith and you're sending out George Yang plus whatever is the matching salary. So you could get another uh, first round pick there, like in this year, like maybe that's how you get a prospect from this year, which you now have a, have a ton of minutes to play. Uh, maybe you get something for Dennis Schroeder for seconds, but like you're in a position. The only question mark I would have is what goes, what's going on with Nick Claxton, who's in free agency. You could keep him and he's not, I mean, he's, what is he? 20, I think he was 20, I think he's 25. So you don't have to be like, well, we're not going to pay him. Yeah. He's 25. Uh, but do you explore signing trade scenarios? Do you sign him with a deal? Um, and he only just turned 25, by the way, in April. Um, do you sign him with a deal, the intent to move him later? I think this makes his free agency and future a little bit more fascinating. Um, but the Nets have set themselves up well. And so I like this. The Knicks deal, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have to like. I think that's a deal that you can even convince yourself was a home run had the Nets not got their own picks back. The fact that they have two con regained control of their next two picks, um, I think that's just absolutely massive for them. So on the Houston front, and we'll dovetail into the discussion with Phoenix apparently, uh, just I feel like so obviously Grant and I have talked a couple of times now. Uh, if you're listening to the off season, look aheads, which you should, they're all still pretty, pretty germane. We covered every single team. Uh, if you're looking at it, like we compared it, to, I would compare it to this. We said, it'd be funny if a second apron team just signed, let's use this as an example. 
what if you just looked back and it's like they gave Royce O'Neal like the exact salary that Jonathan Isaac is making in Orlando or something, or the exact that's a flat number, so that wouldn't really be as fun. Who's on like more of an exact number? It's like, oh, they gave him like the exact number of what Brooke Lopez is making. Another two flat, like the exact number of Kyle Kuzma's making. This is almost like this is on that level, but in pick terms, because if you're Houston now, so you're you're conceding the rights than the next two drafts for the Nets. And this was the unique situation where maybe fans will look back and say, well, God, those picks ended up both being in the top five. They would not have been in the top five if you didn't make this trade. And so it's a unique situation where those picks were more valuable to Brooklyn by far than they ever could have been to Houston. And like, you just got enough stuff here. Like you're changing it out for four different variations of optionality. Um, and like three of them are in post a, post 2026 world but you look at this so this is what phoenix is getting again the 2025 first round swap via the lesser of the of the rockets or thunder for from the for the suns a 2027 first round pick from the suns just outright that's unprotected a 2029 first round pick from dallas or phoenix it's going to be more favorable and so if you're phoenix down the line you look at that as well that's our own pick and then 2029 first round swap via the less favorable of dallas or phoenix so you just have you've like you've cannibalized like you've cornered the market you've covered every single scenario to where you can control phoenix's draft from here on out basically now Woj reported that he there's like three steps to his reporting and so everyone i should be a little bit easier on myself for you know fucking up the the first podcast but like you could tell that he like the reporting was just like trickling out where it's oh they're trying to make a run at kevin durant but oh they could also be making a run at devin booker but wait they, they're willing to put these picks in a deal for another type of player um, I don't know that you could convince me the latter, another type of player, like for right now, I don't think you could convince me that any team would have valued may, Maybe they would have, would you rather have these later sons picks or like these two nets picks? That's an interesting question. I think I would have rather had the nets picks because their, their ceiling is lower than the Suns at full strength. Those picks are coming down the pipeline sooner, but there always would have been a pressure to trade Mikael Bridges if you couldn't get another star. You're sort of kicking the can, so you could just make the case that maybe there will just be teams that value having the later draft equity. I still think, even if, like, especially now, like, imagine if the Nets just made this deal anyway because this this Houston deal wasn't on the table, and it's like, the Knicks just really give us five first-round picks for Mikael Bridges? Did that actually happen plus a swap? Um, so you could... Uh, I I'm going back and forth on this one. I'm not I, like, I, I think you would rather have, I would probably rather have these two nets picks just because even if they didn't make this deal with the, the Knicks now, their floor would still be pretty low. And I know that Phoenix has some of these like injury concerns, um, but Devin Booker still kind of there. That's a higher end star than, than a Mikael Bridges moving forward down the line. And I think the pressure to move Mikael Bridges would have been uh, like, it would have, manifested by this year's trade deadline. And so maybe that 2025 pick ends up being like, eh, but like it still would have been a lottery pick that you're swapping with. And then 2026, I'd have been, I'd have been shocked if Mikael Bridges was still on the roster, like it, even if the Nets didn't acquire their own uh, first rounders there. Because then you get in having to pay him. He's, maybe he doesn't extend off that number for you of all teams. Like why are you taking the, like he could sign a longer extension, but why are you extending off his current number um, if the team isn't good, he might be more likely to do that with the Knicks because the, they're set up to be good and all his fucking friends are there. So, but regardless, even if you think there's more value on these Suns picks to really just corner the market on future Suns picks, like you're trying to acquire one of their players. And there's been stuff floating around that Kevin Durant would have wanted, has wanted to play for Ime Udoka. So you could definitely consider that as a factor. I don't like, I mean, like, I sound that I don't like the idea of Kevin Durant and Houston, but what is the actual cost? Kevin Durant's going into his age 36 season. Is this happening before the year? Okay. Like there's, he gets to go through a training camp. Is it happening in the middle of the season? And then that's just awkward. And then, oh, cool. We're going to have him when he's going through his age 37 season. Like what? So like, I, I, I like it as a sign that they're going to go after Devin Booker more than anything. And like, they, again, they could use these picks. They still have the Brooklyn swap. Like they, they still have all these young, interesting players, Tari Eason, Jalen Green, Alperin Shangun, Jabari Smith Jr., Amen Thompson, Cam Whitmore. Like they're set up and they have salary ballast, or I shouldn't even say ballast because most of them are useful players. It's ballast if you're going to guarantee Jeff Green and Jock Landale, Dylan Brooks, Fred Van Vliet, they're not ballast, but you could use them in, in deals to match trades. So I'm if you want to entertain that they're trying to set themselves up to go for, I don't, I don't know who's like the, like maybe do you think that they're trying to go after Trey Young and they're, 
trying to convince the the Hawks to go for a package in which they're not getting their own draft picks back. But again, wouldn't like they have preferred having the Nets is 2000. And, like when you're looking at they're out their own first in 25, 26 and 27. So you would want to load them up with. Tw- so I just, the way it could be that I'm, I'm open to it. Like maybe they're just looking at it and they're, they expect Zion or somebody to become available and they wanted more picks to include um, like as just a quantity, not, and maybe they view them as better quality. I'm open to that as well. But like this is too many Suns picks. Like this is too many Suns picks at this point to just say no. They're they're going after someone from Phoenix, and I kind of think it's Devin Booker. I am fascinated to see what that does to the Jalen Green, Alperin and Shingun extension talks because Phoenix, uh, Houston right now set up to have a ton of cap space in 2025. Uh, Fred Van Vliet has that team option, so he could be viewed as an expiring contract. If you sign Alperin Shingun or Jalen Green to an extension, one, it becomes much harder to move either of them in a trade because of the poison pill stuff uh, during the middle of the year. But more than that, like you're putting a number on the books that then is costing you, in theory, flexibility. Um, if you wanted to, if you're viewing this as a we're going after Devin Booker next summer. Now, if it is Devin Booker, that does feel like a longer term play. And even if it's Kevin Durant, like they're not. This, are the Suns going to want just back picks? They might want bodies. And so Jalen Green on an extension there. I mean, especially if you're trading. Devin Booker um, using Jalen Green as one of the salary anchors, and that could work. But I do think I would say this trade, and then just the 2025 cap space plan. Uh, if if I had to set the like, I, at least one of these dudes isn't getting an extension. Is I guess how I would frame it. I could see one of them if they're willing to sign for a palatable number. But I think there's now a, a bigger chance that neither Shangun or Green get an extension. They let it leak in restricted free agency. Um, Although, look, maybe you don't. Like, maybe you want Jalen Green extended just to have him on that number four in offseason trade rather than having to wait on delay for that. So maybe I'm viewing this all wrong. But what I will say is that something's up going on in Phoenix. The Rockets know about it. And, like, this is – I'm going to set this, and I'm going to stick with it. If you had to guess, what's the percentage chance that Devin Booker or Kevin Durant are on the Rockets for the start of the 2025-2026 season? So not this coming season, the next season. I'm just going to put it at 51%, more than a coin toss chance there. This is just a, it's a fascinating trade from the Rockets perspective. Um, I do think there's a level of gamble to it, but like when you're looking at what they actually got back and that I'm hemming and hawing over what I view as the more valuable picks. Yeah, those, I might be being skewed by those Nets picks look slightly more valuable right now because they've already done the teardown, but like Phoenix is more implosive and now you have just a sheer number, like a better breadth of picks here. So like you're you're also kicking the can too because like you're delaying some of these commitments um to i mean to go out where you know that you have a swap rights and a first round pick outright just coming in 2029 on top of an additional 2027 first round pick and you're still holding swap rights with the nets so those other obligations the two that you're giving back to the nets run 2026 so i don't think you can actually dislike this deal for houston even if for me i'm wondering if you were making a trade not with Phoenix, is there a chance that the Nets picks that you sent out were viewed as more valuable? Um, just, I think front office might think in more imminent terms too. If you're making that trade right now in 2024 as a front office, do you think you're going to be around for those 2029 first round picks as you hold on to them? Yeah, this, we're going to get closer to 2029 and you will, but I love it for Houston either way. There's, I guess there is a level of risk to it, but like at the same time, the more I think about it, it's just kind of like, I mean, the Nets, yeah, they're going to suck, and maybe they get a top five pick in each of the next two years. They probably weren't going to be that level of bad. I mean, maybe in 2026, because I still think Mikhail Bridges, like that, they would have been forced, their hand would have been forced at some point. But this year specifically, so it wasn't going to be as bad as it's going to be now. So I just keep your eye on Houston, uh, guys, because this is something's going down there. Um, something, I think something's going to go down in Phoenix as a result. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I did post about the double intro. Um, shout out to everyone who continues to text me and message me about the double intro. Yes, I know I I screwed up. I'd recorded something about a, a second part of the Knicks' apron segment, and I included when I had to redo the intro. Uh, I fucked up. It happens. Please, if that was your first experience with the podcast, but you're listening again, I, those mistakes don't happen often. I'm just trying to put out as much content as possible, but I do need to be more mindful uh, meeting in the future with that. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Apple. Flood the comment sections with positivity, even on the shorts or questions. No prompt this time. There was a pr- prompt for our Southeast Division look ahead that went live on Wednesday draft day. So go check that out. We have all teams up now, all 30 teams, like off-season look aheads. Grant and I went deep into them. 
but yes, until next time, and as always, I leave a shout out to the one, the only, maybe a future Nick at this point, if you're looking to kind of surf the minimum market, Frank Nila Kina. <laughs>